our Attorney General Josh Stein to for and thank him for being here with us today to talk about opioid and just share um, what's happening on his end. Um, we really appreciate that. So we are uh, want to make it as effective and, and efficient and timely as possible. So I think you have a, what's your timeline? 11 o'clock? A full hour. So if, An hour? As long as it's being constructive to everybody, we're here. Okay, cool. All right. So we'll make sure that that happens. And um, we have other commissioners here at the table. I want, just want to acknowledge my other commissioners. Uh, Commissioner Carter. Commissioner Burns, uh, Commissioner Jacobs uh, is here, and Commissioner Alum. So we've got the full body here. We, were, right. we could almost be in trouble if we didn't <laughs> announce it as a special session. Do we have a quorum? So unless there's, and our manager is here, and the rest of you, if you'd like to introduce yourselves, and then I will turn it over to our Attorney General. We'll start here. Thank you, Madam Chair. Sheriff Burkhead, Clarence Burkhead. Good to see you, sir. Always. Always. Good morning, Joanne Pierce, General Manager for Community Health and Wellbeing for Durham County. Good morning, Gudrun Parma. I'm the Director of the Criminal Justice Resource Center and serve as the Interim General Manager for Safety. Again, Kim Sowell, County Manager. Great to have you here. Brian Wardell, Senior uh, Assistant County Attorney. Good morning, Kristen Patterson, Assistant Health Director. Good morning, I'm Liz Stevens. I'm the other Assistant Health Director here for Durham. Good morning, uh, Jeff Jang. I'm the medical, medical and Laboratory Director at the Durham County Department of Public Health. I'm Heidi Carter, Durham County Commissioner. Well, come up here and sit beside me, Mr. Dark. Yes, a whole seat that I saved just for you. That's right. Uh, County Commissioner Namashina Burns, thank you for your leadership on this issue, sir. Okay, and we have lots of other uh, staff uh, persons here. In case you have any questions uh, in the audience, but I'm going to turn it over to you and let us go ahead and get started. Howerton, thank you so much. It is, I'm so grateful that you all were able to convene and talk about the opioid crisis. Um, but before we do, I just want to uh, speak to our collective sorrow about what happened in Raleigh last night. Yes. The loss of life, including an officer, duty officer, who I expect was trying to respond to the, to the crisis. And, uh, that this tragedy has befell our region and state is, is heartbreaking. And so thank you for allowing me that. Uh, another source of heartbreak is the opioid crisis, the deadliest drug epidemic in American history, and we are at the deadliest moment of that epidemic. From 2019 to 2020, overdose deaths in this country increased by 40% in a single year. From 2020 to 2021, it increased another 15%. So uh, in 2021, more than 100,000 Americans, 108,000 Americans died of an overdose. Two-thirds of those folks had fentanyl in their systems uh, in the autopsy. North Carolina is not immune from these terrible trends. We're seeing an increasing number of people, uh, over 3,500 overdose deaths in 2021. Uh, Durham County in 2020 had 71 overdose deaths. So you have felt it intensely here as well. And then you ask yourself, well, how could we get to this place? This is not happening in other parts of the world. It's happening here in the United States. What happened? And tragically, it was greed. The greed of some pharmaceutical companies in the late 90s, early 2000s, who worked hard to convince the medical community that opioids were the most effective way to treat pain and they were not addictive. And we now know that neither of those things are true. There are more effective ways to treat pain and certainly they are highly addictive. So my office helped lead a national bipartisan coalition of attorneys general uh, from practically every state in the country to take Purdue Pharma and the Sackler family and other drug companies to court, and we're winning. We won $26 billion 
in the National Opioid Settlement, which was the three major drug distributors, the folks who take the pills from the manufacturer to the drugstore, and one of the manufacturers, Johnson & Johnson, which does generic opioids. Twenty-six billion. We also have eight billion in settlements in principle against three other generic manufacturers, and we have other active uh, investigation, litigation, and negotiation uh, going on against other companies. So the twenty-six billion is obviously sizable, but we're not done um, for you, for your planning purposes. <coughs> we made a decision, and Durham's share of that is about fourteen million dollars over the life of the deal. And in year one. It's over 1.7 million. And when I say Durham, that's both the city and the county. Predominantly, the funds are going to counties, but I think it's the 15 largest cities are also getting a, a chunk. But we made a, de a decision early on in this process, the state did, that we wanted the funds to go to attack the crisis where it is being felt and addressed, and that's predominantly in local government. The sheriff runs the jails. You all have DSS, you have uh, the EMS, you all are the ones who are having to respond to this crisis on a daily basis. And so we trusted you all to use these funds well to address the crisis. So 85% of the 26 billion, 750 million is coming to North Carolina. 85% are going to local governments, 15% of the state. There's not another state that structured it this way. Almost all of them gave the majority or at least half the money to the state government and not to local governments. So that was a conscious decision that we made uh, because we want to have the greatest impact we possibly can. But regardless of what level of government it goes to, state or local or city, county or city, it has to go to attack the crisis. It's a requirement that the funds be set aside in a reserve account, can't go to fix potholes, it can't go for property tax relief, it has to go to addressing the crisis. And there are four broad categories of, of money, uh, of uses you can use the money for. Prevention, treatment, recovery, or harm reduction strategies. And those broad categories involve a lot of different ideas. And honestly, I feel a little chagrined to be even saying this to Durham County because you all have been on the cutting edge of many of these strategies. And so when I say that these are strategies, you're like, yeah, check, 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 because <laughs> uh, you all have been doing it but it's evidence-based uh, addiction treatment with medication-assisted therapies, recovery support services, housing, employment, transportation, naloxone distribution, post-overdose response teams, syringe service programs, criminal justice diversion programs, which the sheriff's already been doing, a treatment for people who are in jail, which the sheriff has already been doing, reentry programs, which I know you all work exceptionally hard on, so these are all permissible activities, and what I've been doing in recent weeks is traveling around the state and meeting with county officials and, and law enforcement officials to learn how are they using their money, and also really how are they deciding how they're going to use their money, because a lot of them are undergoing very comprehensive strategic assessments and planning so that they can determine uh, how they want to use it. Yesterday in Onslow County, they've been going through this um, community engagement process. They identified what an ideal continuum of care for people with opioid addiction would be, identified what the assets in their community were, what the gaps were in the community, and then prioritized among those initiatives. And uh, it was a very thoughtful approach, and they are going, uh, in the process of soon recommending to their county commission. Uh, others have already allocated some funding. Um, so. I, what I'm interested in is having a discussion with you to really just understand how you are wrestling with these issues. Because the, the unfortunate reality is it's never going to be enough money. I mean, you all are going to go through that money so quickly because there are many more good ideas than there are dollars to fund them. Uh, but the, pra the process of coming up with a strategic plan will be helpful because if we come up with new sources of funds from other cases, we can tag tap into that. If there are other grant funds from the federal government, you can tap into that. Um, so we, we hope it, it's a useful process for you. And we have a tool called the Community Opioid Resources Engine of North Carolina, Core NC, uh, a lot of words for a website, <laughs> NC, <laughs> ncopioidsettlement.org, ncopioidsettlement.org. And it's got a ton of useful data. It's got ideas that different counties, and I, you all are featured, uh, are doing to tackle the crisis. It's got 
data like overdose death rates, prescription pill uh, usage rates, social determinants of health. So it's county by county, but it's also for every county in the state. It's just a really good tool. And then there will be a third part, which is under construction, which is called the investments dashboard. And this is really for the benefit of the people of North Carolina in that we want full transparency on the decisions that the state makes and the county makes. And you, counties are required to identify every group they fund, how much did they fund, and critically, what were the outcomes of that investment? Because we want the money to mean something. And that means if you all pursue a strategy and for two or three years it's just not working, find a different strategy because there are others out there that, that will work. Um, I want to just say a, a word about my, my good friend, the sheriff, because you all, having done this MAT in the jails, you all are on the, on the uh, front edge on this. And to recognize you have folks in your jails who are addicted and have engaged in crime, but their crime is almost ex exclusively driven by their addiction. And if you can address their addiction, you can break that cycle of criminal behavior which is great for that individual, and it's great for all of us. We want to drive down crime rates, and, and so your sheriff has been great on that. Sheriff Burkhead has been a leader on our task force for racial equity in criminal justice to identify wide-ranging reforms we can make to the criminal justice system, uh, and he um, uh, has been a great partner, Satana DeBerry, on rape kits. You all are on the, again, leading edge of how to tackle a backlog of untested sexual assault kits, and so I thank you, District Attorney, and Sheriff, thank you for all you do for the people of Durham County. Um, and so as I travel around the state and I encounter people of immense goodwill and, and passion, there's so much commitment to tackling this crisis and to helping people live better lives. And then I've also met many, many people who are in long-term recovery, and really just they personify the hope that we want to spread which is that there is a life in recovery, that there are more people living a life in recovery, long-term recovery, than there are in active addiction. And we just have to help people who are in that dark place realize that there is a better future for them. And you combine that dedication, passion, and creativity with this source of funding that we've been able to secure. Uh, I'm so optimistic about what we will collectively do. And what I'm certain of is that Next year and the year after that and the year after that, there will be people alive and healthy in Durham County than otherwise would have been. And so I'm just grateful for the good work that you all have already done and eager to see the great work you will do. Thank you, Sheriff. You are welcome. Thank you. And, uh, and I'll thank you again for your fight to make this happen because it wasn't just going to happen. It didn't, I assure you it did not just happen. <laughs> No, I, I've been around for a while, for a few years, and know when all the, the fight began. And we appreciate your fight uh, to make this happen and take care of citizens across the state of North Carolina. Uh, so at this time, it, we will open it up for questions or comments. We can, any questions, or we just can follow the agenda to the next item here. Um, updates on the planning process. You want to do that? Okay, let's sure. do that. Thank you so much, uh, Madam Chair. Okay. And thank you again, Attorney General Stein, for lifting up the, the work that we are doing here in Durham County to address the issue. Um, and to your point about the comprehensive strategic process, that is certainly the method that we intend to employ. Um, we are doing a lot, but we don't want to assume that what we're doing is effective. And so we are um, planning a survey process that will go out to our entire community um, to ask them, what do you think, what should we be doing? Are there gaps in the services that are being provided? And based on that data that we get, we um, intend to have a town hall to discuss the, the findings and the data that came out of that survey. Um, but I'd like to turn it over to our staff, um, Gudrun Palmer and Joanne Pierce, if they have any more to add, because they are, you know, boots on the ground and helping lead the effort in the work that's happening to address this. Good morning again. Um, so 
we have been looking at it, right? And we have been discussing it. We actually had a, co a conversation with, with um, our board uh, in early September. And Durham County has been discussing the, um, the opioid uh, crisis and also in, our our problem is poly substance use. It's not just. It's never only opioids. So we have the Durham Joint Together Task Force that w came out of a North Carolina Association of County Commissioner initiative several years ago. We have been continuing to to meet regularly. We have a monthly um, committee meeting that discusses opioid treatment options that we have here in Durham. But we, we briefed the board again on the, on the opioid settlement f framework and, and then um, discussed the path forward. And we, we, we have already taken a look at the, the 12 strategies on the option A and identified our inventory in Durham, which is continuously changing and growing with, with treatment options. Um, and, and as our managers mentioned, we intend to roll out a website, a survey, have a town hall, and then bring some recommendations and findings to the board to make some decisions and, and hopefully have some, some quick wins and, and maybe fund some of our already existing programs that are not, not sufficiently funded or currently are grant funded and then continue, continue to look at the options because as you said, it's 18 years and just because we fund something now, we can fund something different in a few years. So, so th that's our path forward that we have proposed to the board and I think we are moving fairly quickly here in the next few months. Joanne. Uh, Gudrun really uh, explained that very well. I will just say that um, we certainly recognize that it, re it requires a multi-pronged, multi-system, coordinated and strategic approach to addressing the issue that also looks at, as you mentioned, uh, Mr. Attorney General, the root cause and also embedding equity. And we've been meeting because we know that it's not just a public health crisis, it, it crosses many different sectors, our social service system, criminal justice resource center, um, uh, department and also um, the sheriff's office and just community. And so um, we, we have been meeting and having those discussions. Who is most impacted? How do we address it? And the, the four-pronged approach that you, you've mentioned about prevention, treatment, uh, recovery and harm reduction. And today also we have our medical director for our public health department, our two deputy public health directors here with us as well to even talk about the, that work that we're doing there. So um, we, we are poised uh, to do the work. We are poised to gather additional information and data to see how we can enhance and strengthen the work that we're already doing. And we know the, as you've mentioned, the funds won't necessarily solve everything, but what can we do to have the most impact on the people that we serve? Thank you. So if we are if there are no questions, um, probably it's best to just continue with the agenda and have the questions at the end. So um, the next area is the Durham Health, County Health um, updates, public health. Yeah. Um, I'll start us off and pass to my colleagues. Uh, good morning again. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I so appreciate what General Manager Pierce just shared about the fact that we know this crisis crosses so many different areas and touches people in so many different aspects of their life. And I think that the activities that we're doing within public health really uh, really are across the department and include so much work with our community-based organizations and our community partners, uh, with our clients, with other uh, staff among the county and among the city. So I think um, that just really rings true with what our efforts look like in public health. I'll speak a bit to some of what we're doing out of our pharmacy. That's one of the areas that I'm over in my role. Um, so through our pharmacy, we are distributing safe syringe kits um, from the department uh, daily. We also are distributing naloxone kits uh, from the department for folks to pick up. We have them in all of our clinics. We have them being brought to outreach events. Um, Kristen will speak to some of our outreach teams who are actually out 
providing the safe syringe and naloxone kits to folks in the community. Um, but we, we did uh, share uh, on the handout that you'll see here just some of our statistics for the past couple of years. Since we've had this safe syringe program and naloxone programs in place, we've seen a steady increase, which has been wonderful. Um, and I'll, I'll mention, particularly around the pandemic, we know that uh, everything changed for everyone with COVID. And we saw uh, that reflected in many of our services within public health. But as we started coming out of the pandemic, we really saw an uptick in the utilization of our safe syringe kits and our naloxone kits. So we, we kind of, we, we suspect that word is out in the community. We've, we've been providing these services for a while and we have some really trusted, um, really trusting clients who continue to spread the word. So as people started kind of coming out again after the pandemic, we saw that they were certainly coming to us and utilizing these harm reduction um, tools. So um, I'll pass to Kristen to speak a little bit about our outreach. Good morning again. Again, my name is Kristen Patterson and I'm over the outreach health education um, part of the health department. And when within our department, we actually go out. So we are actually boots on the ground. And whenever you're boots on the ground, you see, um, of course, we deal with STI. But a lot of times, whenever we're engaging with our community, we ask them, what got you to this, pro this, this, actually this point in life that you are now positive with either HIV or some type of STI? Well, a lot of it is because they were trying to get their fix of drugs. So they, they are on opioids and they're doing whatever they have to do to get this drug. So we know that, you know, it does increase the um, STIs because, you know, like I said, they're trying to get this fixed. So we do have our teams out there with the naloxone, with safe syringes, or we tell them, oh, you can come to the health department. No one's gonna judge you because a lot of stigma is to that, you know, mm -hmm. but we have to let our clients know, we're not here to judge, we're here to help. And what does help look like to you guys? Because we can say what we think help look like, but until we meet those folks on where they are and ask what does help means to you, then that's how we're more effective. And we do work with harm reduction, mm -hmm. but we don't just partner with them, we actively work. Because we see partnerships, but they're just partnerships around the table. But when you're actually on the street, we have to make sure that we're actively engaging. So we bring um, harm reduction with us, mm -hmm. and we're actually talking to people and really listening and not talking at them. Because that's some of the things that we um, experienced in the past. People our community are always saying, you're talking at us, but you're not listening to us while we're here. Because no one just wake up and say, I'm gonna do drugs today or you know, engage in risky behavior. Something, like you said, there's a root cause. So we try to get to the root cause to find out what's going on and how can we assist our community. So if somebody you offer services to says to you, you know what, I'm ready to take this drug. We do have resources that, mm -hmm. like I said, we are actively working with our community-based um, 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 clinicians in our community. Mm -hmm. So we do link them to, we, we don't just give them a phone number, we call, we make that first initial appointment and we link them into care. And we, in our team, we do follow up mm -hmm. to make sure that they stay in care or they come out. Did they have to come out? Mm -hmm. Yes. And we, we, one of the things that I think is really great about what we do is we work very closely with EMS. And so you can see this kind of, this bottom table here, these are the number of um, times EMS has responded to um, opiate related, so not exclusively, but typically overdoses. And we have a, a peer support um, system, which I think, you know, um, maybe uh, answers some of the questions you were asking that they, they are working closely with EMS, so they will con try to make contact with that person within 72 hours and ask them, okay, what, what sorts of services can we help you with? Is it housing, is it food, or are you ready to make, you know, take that step you know, regarding you know, starting on uh, medication? And so um, you know, we, we make every effort to you know, reach those people. Um, it, it can be challenging at times, depending on the social cir you know, circumstances of the individual who's overdosed, and I think that's where potentially more, you know, more research, 
resources will help. The person that runs this program only works part time. She's only funded part time, and we really need someone, you know, that can, you know, try to tackle these issues full time. And just one more thing, I just um, just hearing. Um, We've just really leaned into the issue, the problem, because it's not going to go away um, on its own. And we've determined and know that effective diagnosis will determine effective treatment. And so those of us, you know, when we think about um, those of us maybe across the state or the country who will be effective are going to be those of us who are willing to go all in to really unpack what's happening, why. Um, people are situated differently in society and having these outcomes and really being um, bold and willing, uh, willing enough to um, roll up our sleeves and just really implement um, novel intervention activities that will also cause our systems to change where they need to change in policies and practices and procedures. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, now we go to our justice system update. Sure, Burkett and on our attorney, the, our DA. Yes. You pass it to me? Whichever, oh, <laughs> one no, of y'all. Is that no. one of y'all? <laughs> no, I'm always eager to talk about the great work that we're doing. Thank you, Ms. Attorney General, and thank you for your, your earlier comment. Uh, in the detention center, we started MAT uh, in 2019, uh, shortly after I became sheriff. And we have continued to expand that program. Uh, we, now have, we now call it SMART, Sheriff's Medicated, uh, Medication Assisted, Restorative, and Treatment, because we want to treat the whole person. And uh, just throw out some numbers. Uh, since then, since those uh, 2019, we've treated 258 men and women. Uh, directly through our MAT program, and we've had uh, right at 21% recidivism rates, which is fantastic. Those folks who are getting treatment are not returning to our facility. We too are connected. 28% recidivism? 21. 21. Mm -hmm. 79, not. Yeah, yeah not, correct. Okay. And we are connecting uh, those individuals to external resources once they are released. We have partnerships all across the county uh, and we have a peer support program uh, that again like public health follows those individuals make sure they get their appointments make sure they take their medication uh, if they do come back to us we try to figure out what happened where did the breakdowns occur uh, my team and you see most of them sitting in the audience uh, really work day in and day out to address this situation in our, in our facility uh, and we're happy to do it in the facility. We, we would love to pass the torch to someone else, but right now we are it as far as those who are incarcerated. Been arrested for a crime, as you mentioned a moment ago, that was committed largely to, to, to feed their addiction. And so we do not want to continue to criminalize We are going into the phase two. We are now in phase two. Uh, we've had conversation with the board and the manager about how we can expand our services moving forward. So perhaps uh, some of the opioid money that is coming to the county will fund my uh, medical director that we're requesting so we can pay more attention to the needs of the individuals in our facility and again uh, administer methadone and morphine and really create a uh, patient nursing home for those individuals who are incarcerated so we can have a, a smooth handoff uh, when they are released. So we're, we're excited about it. And uh, I will say we were the first detention center in North Carolina to uh, implement MAT. Mecklenburg followed, uh, followed our lead shortly thereafter. Uh, we're just proud of the work that we're doing and, and hats off to my staff that day in and day out. And, and we too, during COVID, saw a slight increase and so we continue delivering these services and we certainly want to have the, the highest standard that we can here in North Carolina. Thank you. Thank you. So I wanted to let the sheriff go first because we like to say in our office, we're not first responders, we're the last responders. Um, and so 
we have um, we work really closely with the Criminal Justice Resource Center in our two criminal justice diversion programs. We have both a pretrial diversion program as well as a post adjudication um, program. We we kind of essentially call the we call the pretrial one mental health court, and we call the post adjudication one drug court. I think we've been talking about how we talk about our recovery court. Um, as opposed to kind of delineating them that way. Um, but we uh, have found we, we are, are focused on harm reduction in both of those courts. Um, I think our major challenge in our post adjudication court uh, has been MAT um, and having a community MAT provider as we try to move this post adjudication court away from using jail as a sanction, um, we it's challenging because our main Medicaid assisted treatment program is in the jail. And so we, the, uh, what is it, best evidence, the ev best practice, the best practice for a recovery court is that you do not use your detention center as a sanction. And so we are committed to not doing that, and yet we need more uh, places because the thing that we know about people who use is that they're gonna use. And that they can follow through on kind of all of the requirements of the court, but sometimes um, they're gonna take a step back. And what we don't wanna be doing is putting people in the detention center for doing what we know they are gonna do. Um, so there's that part. Uh, in my office, uh, my assistant district attorneys have been working with the out outreach team and peer support to really identify what possession looks like as opposed to what dealing looks like. So people who use opioids can uh, possess a tremendous amount of that substance because they use all day and they use in pairs to protect each other's, their safety. Um, one person may buy, another person may hold. That's to keep them from being robbed. It is so that they can help each other um, if they overdose. And so having an understanding of that has really changed the way that we prosecute. Uh, and so we can see, as you know, the North Carolina drug laws um, over penalize the possession of um, heroin, you can get, you can have trafficking weights without being a trafficker. And so now we have come to understand the difference between um, possessing a large amount for the, for the use of you and your partner as opposed to the trafficking. Um, and so, I, you know, I want to thank the sheriff and Gudrun um, because we are all pulling in the same direction. We have, you know, little holes here and there that we're trying to fill, but a big one um, is is community-based MAT, as well as kind of supportive transitional housing for people. I, I was gonna ask about the, <coughs> the exactly that, community resources for treatment, uh, what the sort of census is in Durham County. I'm aware of TROSA, which provides wonderful services, but they don't offer MAT. Um, and so for some people, I mean, there's some addictions for which medication doesn't work, you know, methamphetamine or cocaine, but there are other addictions like opioids where there is actually a medication that can help in, in their long-term recovery as part of their medical treatment. And so do they exist? Are there outpatient services and um, so I, I've been, thanks to the North Carolina Association of County Commissioners launching uh, initiative many years ago, I've been co-chairing our community-wide task force called Durham Joins Together to Save Lives. And honestly, that has been the foundation of what we have now because it is a collective impact model. We're a cross-system model and it allowed us to get grants the way the MAT program in the jail started was from a grant, and now it's locally funded. Um, we have a linkages to care program through, the pub through public health that is tracking 
um, what happens with our opioid response when somebody overdoses, how they using peer support, getting them into treatment. All of these things have happened because we've been successful because we have a collaboration across sectors and we've been able to get a lot of grants. We just got a grant um, for our familiar faces. Our um, EMS program um, is got over a million dollars now, but for four years, we, they're gonna start distributing fentanyl strips, Narcan, but what I'm really excited about is we're gonna start a bridge program where our EMS, our paramedics, community paramedics are going to be able to offer MAT on the spot when somebody overdoses. And that, I think that's what some of the lessons learned for us is, as we heard, we have to go where people are. We, we have to reduce the barriers uh, and then the recovery piece. Um, but we have Lincoln Community Health Center is one of our big providers for MAT. We also have other providers in the community. Um, but Lincoln is, uh, to, the, to our DA's point about a community-based program, we are about to open a just an MAT standalone facility in Lakewood Shopping Center. Um, but we know one of the barriers has been the copay. Even if it's a dollar, five dollars, the city is using all of their MAT funds, I mean, sorry, all of their opioid funds for Lincoln, at least for the first few years. And that's gonna really help with that. Um, but um, I, I just, I, I personally just wanted to share that, um, you know, the, for me, one of the messages has been uh, about um, recovery and, and the support that we have to provide long term. Um, and related to the question about supportive housing, again, we need, you know, hopefully we'll look at additional funding uh, for that. And, um, and, and also the importance of the peer support specialists. They, they are really the vital link in, in helping people through this whole journey. That all makes, okay. that all makes sense to me. Uh, just one point I wanna underline is that when we want more service providers to offer healthcare in the form of MAT to people, we have to find out ways to pay them because people don't provide services for free. Right. And most people pay for their health care with health insurance, but this population typically is not insured, and that's why it's imperative that the General Assembly expand Medicaid to cover yep. hundreds of thousands of neighbors that have health insurance, they'd have a means to pay for their health care, and that would mm -hmm. include MAT. And I have a feeling this is a table I don't need to persuade. <laughs> <laughs> you would have 100% <laughs> <laughs> But uh, <laughs> we just got to keep talking about it. We got to keep talking yeah. about it because we're we're at a moment where it's more likely than it's ever been because the president pro tem has endorsed it, the speaker of the house has endorsed it, and of course the governor is long time been a champion. So let's make the moment worth something. Yeah, agree with you there wholeheartedly, Commissioner Burns. Mine was relatively quick. Um, <laughs> Thank you for saying expanded Medicaid, so I didn't have to. But uh, I think the initial question was about like what other resources we have, and I think Commissioner Jacobs did a great job of enveloping everything, but I hope that it illustrates, uh, if nothing else, that it is in the marrow of every department in this building. You know, we have, the fact that our EM, EMS staff is on board, that is not what you will see from Murphy to Manio. By virtue of this settlement and the way it's coming down, it's a Murphy to Manio issue, but you don't have that type of energy, and we do have it here. We're blessed and lucky to have it. You, your question was about what other spaces. Another example that has been traveling with uh, County Commissions Association uh, and Jason King and a lot of work they've been doing is Jubilee Home. That is right here in Durham. Um, and right, thank you. I, I was one. Yeah, so we do have other pockets outside of Trosa. One of the things that when, when Jubilee Home actually presents they make it very clear um, if they had 10 more houses, uh, they could fill them and people would come in because their success rate is so high. Their recidivism uh, rate is so low. And I, I bring that up because I want to at least showcase people want help. Like they, and I think that one's male focused. Y'all keep me uh, jubilees. So, you know, I also want to uplift. This is an all women board. We have to think about these safe spaces for women as well. So I do want to interject that because so many of them are uh, very male focused and, and that includes here. And there is another jubilee home. But, um, and I think my last point that I'll make, um, 
I'm I'm excited that you're leading this effort. I don't. I'm pretty sure everybody got the mail. We have a great staff here. Our public health staff is very knowledgeable. But you took the initiative to send everybody a handout that said, "This is how much money your county is getting." You would not believe how many of our colleagues did not even know money was coming, but for your letter, right? But for that, and so knowing they didn't know that, NACO did a. Uh, I think some of this was beforehand. NACO had already done. Not NACO. Kevin Leonard would kill me. <laughs> ACC, North Carolina Association of County Commissioners, NCACC. They did a two-day forum at uh, the Grandover. And I sat down, and the very first thing somebody said to me was, who do you work for? And I'm always intrigued that I, I can't be a county commissioner. But <laughs> and she said, who do you work for? And it was because 80% of the room was consultants. That day that we came to get Dr. Sowell was with me, they literally had chairs on the walls. So I do just want to interject. There are people trying to profit off of this problem. And the same way you fight, fight scam artists, artists, the same way you've led on this, I hope that we can get the help that we need to these other counties where they don't spend money in consultants because that's what we see happening. And okay. Just one, I appreciate all that. Thank you very much. Uh, County uh, Commissioner Association has been just an incredible ally with us in this work. And they got actually a small amount of money out of the settlement as well, and they've used it to hire uh, a woman. I think she's a Durham resident. Nitty yeah. says she's yeah. She's working with us. She's working yeah. with okay. us. So yeah. I was just going to say Nitty yeah. is an incredible asset, and she exists to support the work of county commissioners so that they don't have to hire consultants because yeah. she's there to advise. So. I'm, again, telling y'all something you don't need. You already know. So. Well, you know, the, the Associ North Carolina Association of Counties have been very instrumental in assisting all counties, including Durham, of finding uh, innovative ways to do all kinds of things. You know, uh, most of us, most of the commissioners, have been a part of the association for years. And, you know, I've been there for, for a few minutes. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'm heading to a board meeting shortly. But they have all of these sessions and trainings that all of us participate in. And they and Kevin and the team has been absolutely incredible in lifting this conversation up and making sure that we have the tools and information that we need. And also at the national level, the National Association of Counties have been bringing forth information that we can use and ways that we can bring to our counties to help our citizens. So this is such a, uh, such a important conversation. And you know, the, I, I guess, you know, when you've been around for a minute, I, it takes me back to one of the commissioners when he was a president of the association. Um, his son uh, passed away from opioid. And his initiative was to do something about all the opioid and the death. Yeah, yeah. So this is a long-standing conversation that we need to save lives rather than continue to lose lives. So I just wanted to bring that up because we, you know, sometimes things get put on the table and you don't think they're important. And then they do become important. So I will never forget him fighting for us as commissioners to really lift this conversation up. So. Yeah, we're from the Stanley County Committee, but yeah. he's still at it. He's still fighting. You gotta fight. Other questions, comments, concerns you wanna share? Thanks. Um, one, what I think I've heard um, that would be really important is that we can also use our data to shift the narrative about who's having, more often people are in recovery, moving to recovery, and if we can uplift that as well, because we're often talking about, obviously, those who are not, um, you know, having the best outcomes. How, however, while we're doing that, making the case for that, we should also uplift those who are having those successes, because I think that's gonna be really important for a larger buy-in. And one other um, program that we have um, is the formerly incarcerated transition program, which is key because we have we know through data that the most vulnerable time for someone um, could be when they're being released from 
um, detention or incarceration where you're just overstimulated. You've been away for a while, you're in sort of recovery, and now you're having to deal with food, safety, shelter. Um, now you have all these requirements that you have to be here, there, and everywhere. And that's, that's a really important moment where people have really bad outcomes. And so we've also sort of put together a program to fill in that gap. So then you have a soft handoff to someone who works in the health department who says, hey, you know, what are your most immediate pressing needs? Because we always go back to Maslow's hierarchy of need. Like, are, are your basic needs being met before we kind of want you to self-actualize? So those few things. I want to address both of your points in a single story, which is our, our mutual friend, Sheriff Miller, up in Buncombe. I don't know if he got it. It was either Duke or RPI has done an analysis of his MAP program and RPI. And I don't know if they've done yours yet, but what they've done is measure the impact of the MAP program in the jail. And what they've discovered is, because uh, Duran's absolutely right, that the people most at risk of overdose death are those leaving incarceration because they were addicted before they went to jail, they're addicted while they're in jail, they're just not using, they're addicted when they get out of jail and they use at the old level and their body doesn't have the tolerance for it. So then they overdose and die. Something like 40 times the death rate of the general using population. Wow. Well, what they've achieved in Buncombe, and they have the data, and I, I wager to say, Sheriff, you have a similar story to tell if we can get the data, is the death rate of people leaving jail in Buncombe County is below the death rate of the general population, mm -hmm. which is a tremendous accomplishment. It's because they do the MAP in jail with the peer support specialist, and then the warm handoff to the outpatient MAP providers, and they're having the same experience with reduced recidivism, it, it's exactly what we want to see happening, but that's why we have this uh, database where we're gonna require full transparency. Part of it is to incent counties to do the measurement. Is this program actually saving lives? Because I think you're right that the more, I think there's a lot of positive stories that exist that we haven't uh, captured in number. And the more we have those numbers and that data, it starts to snowball and we've got a better story to tell. And then you're giving more hope to people who are struggling and they realize there is a chance for them. And it all flows in that way. I'd like to piggyback on one thing related to our formerly incarcerated transitions program because I'm so glad you brought that up. It's a small but mighty program that we have in public health that works. And I think that one of the strengths of that program is that it utilizes community health workers to connect with folks who have just come out of incarceration and to really walk them through those early days and weeks and months um, transitioning back into a supportive community. And I think that the community health worker piece is key because these are professionals with lived experience that can relate to some of the challenges that the, their clients are dealing with. And I continue to dwell on the fact that we, we learned a lot about community health workers during COVID, right? We saw the effectiveness of community health workers in lots of different ways. And I think that we need to continue, I, I continue to, to talk and we continue to talk within public health about how do we keep that going? And what are the other places and ways that community health workers or peer support specialists or folks with lived experience working directly with the communities that they are a part of, um, how can that help to move the needle forward? So I think that's something that just statewide, we need to continue to keep keep high on our radar because we saw aspects of, of peer support and community health worker um, activity that, that really worked during COVID and it very much relates to the, the topic at hand. I just wanna follow up on that quickly and say the, you know, whether it's, um, substance abuse, whether it's gun violence, all of the issues that we're facing, especially as an urban community, the thing that we know is that case management works. And that's the only thing that's ever worked, and it's the only thing that ever will work. And I think as we talk about how do we talk about these challenge, these unique modern challenges that face us, we need to be talking about what it means to have just case management, having people in that community, working with other people in that community to make things better. And so that's just my soapbox. 
That raises a question for me, Satana and, and Liz. I'm just wondering, hearing the, about the importance of the community health worker and also the, the case manager, do, in, so in addition to not having enough funding, funding being inad inadequate to pay for the services, is there also a shortage of people who are trained as community health workers or peer support specialists? And, and is, some, is that something that we should be thinking about as a community as well? As it relates to community health workers, I feel like there is a lot of activity happening statewide around community health worker certification and training to kind of continue to grow that group. But yes, I would say definitely um, there, there is a need to be sure that the folks that we're putting into those positions are doing so in a prepared way, right, to do avoid, avoid doing harm. Um, so yes. I, I, you know, maybe five or eight, 10 years ago, we we're working in Durham to, and, and across the state, to develop a certification program for community health workers. And there's one at Durham Tech now. Didn't used to be. Joanne Pierce is nodding because she and I served on that same task force. But just wondering if Durham Tech has something similar for peer support specialists. But um, whenever I was on that task force, and of course, you know, when the funding ended, so did the task force. That was some of the issues was the funding to be able to send, you know, the ones who want to become pure, the uh, certified. Yeah. These seem like easy problems to solve. You know, we've got money coming in and we've identified two instances where we need more funding. You know, now we need to develop the skill set of peer support specialists, community health workers, and also we needed to pay for the MAT services for patients. So we just need to connect them to the care. I, I, I just think that recovery, the statistics show that recovery doesn't happen as readily for people who aren't receiving the standard of care, which is medicine for treatment. And so that's where we, I feel like we really need to connect people to that care, and then we need to be sure we've got the support specialists. And if we can work with Durham Tech and the, the new Allied Health Building to have a good program there, maybe that's, those are two good places to, to focus. Not to brag on Durham County government and our work and uh, <laughs> no, at for community okay, health workers. Okay. <laughs> so uh, our community health workers were very instrumental in the public in public health department in um, helping to put that program together for Durham Tech. That's one thing. Um, even asking to come in to teach courses because you have these lived experience um, uh, professionals, paraprofessionals coming to. Uh, provide training and support for the next generation of folks. And also, um, I had the pleasure of serving on the state's community health workers um, work where, as um, our deputy um, health director mentioned, we were looking at, you know, how to um, do the credentialing and how would it work where if someone became a certified community health worker, would it be portable? Can they go to another county? So all of those things were being worked out. And also Chair Howerton and Commissioner Carter uh, were on the Board of Health at the time when we were having those conversations. And so again, our public health, many of our departments across our county department enterprise, we're willing to just you know, be on the cutting edge, bleeding edge even, to really make change that we know structurally we need. So just wanted to share that. Just to support Commissioner Jacobs, what are you hearing across the state uh, regarding uh, the need for clinical workers or for nurses? Uh, we are hearing, there. we know there's a shortage all over. And I know that Duke is doing training and certification and. UNC and um, uh, Durham Tech is working. What are you hearing from other states? Or there's an interesting rate you said where uh, all across the state, healthcare workers are in high demand. That is another reason why expanding Medicaid is so critical because if you have 600,000 people with insurance who can all pay for their healthcare, then healthcare providers have a need to compensate staff. But we still need to increase the, it's the same issue about the, the flow of trained personnel. Um, we need to increase the number of people in nursing school and PA schools and possibly even medical schools. So there are a lot of structural problems with our healthcare system that we need to work on and make time for. Thank you, Attorney General uh, Stein. 
Yeah, we're talking about, obviously, you know, you don't have to preach uh, Medicaid expansion to us as a board, but I think also when we're having that conversation of Medicaid expansion, we also need to talk about the roadblocks that would still exist within Medicaid expansion. And I know I've talked to Sheriff Burkhead briefly about this and Gudrun um, about the Medicaid inmate exclusion policy that we need to get federal level change to make sure that uh, individuals who are leaving our jails, who are currently in our jails, that once they have Medicaid, that they're able to receive the behavioral health services that will be funded. And that's going to take us as a board and you as our attorney general advocating for that at the federal level to make sure that once we expand Medicaid here in North Carolina, everyone is able to have access to the resources that that will provide them. I just wanted to, on this, I think this is a very important discussion about the pipeline of peer support specialists and community health workers when we talk about the system. And Gudrun, if you could just talk a little bit about the resources and the training related to peer support specialists. Um, and one other issue I want to raise is that and another important purpose for uh, these folks is that, that, that we're providing employment for people. Um, that's part of the recovery process is that people have to have jobs and we're, um, that's a barrier. Uh, especially people who are criminal justice involved. And if we can be paying folks who are in the role now as a community health worker or a peer support specialist, we're also benefiting those folks. So before we go to Gudrun, so to keep you on your schedule, it's 11 o'clock. So we'll give her five, five more minutes. If you can give us five more minutes, we'll wrap it up. Okay. <laughs> So we actually had a conversation as part of our committee around peer support and, and persons with lived experience because we know that individuals can get trained. At UNC uh, uh, Chapel Hill has a training for peer support, but there is a special component for persons that are justice involved that needs to happen as well because, you know, they... And then the, the next piece is the continuous support, and that's also Chibu Lihom was talking about, that, that persons jump right in and, 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 and want to help so much that they burn themselves out or they don't, they're not continuing to, to watch that line and, and, and fall back themselves or, or do harm instead of helping individuals. So we are... Tr Obviously, many communities now have a local reentry council that has funding from DPS, NCDPS, for for training, education. So there are opportunities to to assist individuals with um, paying for that training. But then we were actually hoping we could get some ARPA money to to build a re uh, a peer support network in Durham where where we can develop that pipeline and. Uh, provide the training, the additional uh, criminal justice component, and then the continued support, and yeah. ba basically build a support network for peer support. Is there a statewide association or network? That, that would be a great gathering of people mm -hmm. to host the statewide. Peer support. <laughs> peer support. Economic, yeah. economic development, here we go. Yeah, I've asked the new president of the association to ha host conference right here in Durham. I'm pushing for her to do that in Durham. Maybe that would be the one to talk to her about doing. So we so appreciate you taking the time to come and be with us this morning uh, and just let us know where things are, are and where they're headed. Um, and we are here for any questions that you may have later on. And uh, we just want to keep this rolling and do the best job we can for citizens of Durham. As I've been on the job for six years and trying to wrestle with how can we make systems work better for people. Uh, I have relied on y'all's expertise time and time again because you all are on the cutting edge of, of how to serve constituents, uh, many of whom have had a bad run. And uh, I, I thank you for your sharing with me uh, up until this time and even in this, mo this morning. And very eager to see the successes that I'm certain you're going to have with the funds once you finish your strategic planning and, and start making investments. Thank you for having me today. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
A pleasure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. this is good. Yes.